All right, so I just want to tell my story on kind of where I started and how I ended up um, in the area of spirituality I'm in today. So like a lot of people, I grew up Christian. Um, I was a part of the same church since bef- since I was in my mom's stomach. Like I, I grew up there. Um, and I, un- unlike a lot of people, I've never had a falling out with my former pastor. <clears throat> He's a good person. Me and him are still on good terms. I have nothing negative to say about my former pastor. Um, so I grew up in church, but that didn't necessarily mean I was a Christian. <laughs> um, something we used to say all the time back in that system is, uh, just because you sit in the garage don't mean you a car. So just because you go to church doesn't mean you're a Christian, right? So similar to that, I grew up in church, but it wasn't until I got in middle school um, that I started to somewhat take my Christianity serious. Where I started, because it was the beginning of me starting to pursue God, realizing that God does exist and that should come with a lifestyle change so it was around my middle school years when I started to really embrace Christianity Um, that was around the time I got baptized started reading the Bible I remember there was a moment and this was my seventh grade year I want to say yeah where I remember being woken up I, I woke up one morning it was a weekend And I tried to go back to sleep. And in that moment, I felt like I was pushing into a different realm. And then I heard a super loud trumpet blast hit my ears and it startled me and I couldn't go back to sleep. Um, I now have some area of idea of what was going on uh, in hindsight, but that was the first somewhat supernatural experience that. Um, somewhat propelled me. That was when I had first started reading the Bible. Um, (laughs) So middle school was my formative year. So I started out, I read the Bible several times. I was listening to audio books. I stopped listening to secular music and only listened to gospel. Um, And that was all night. I had a laptop and I would play sermons and I would play uh, gospel music and I would play uh, Bible audio books 24 7 even when I left my uh, my house or left my room I would leave my laptop playing so that the sound could kind of saturate the environment so when I was in I was in right <laughs> um, it was in Christianity when I started having my um, encounters with God so it I don't want to discredit them in that way as if there was nothing good that came out of it. Cause it did. I'm still friends and family with a decent portion of people that I met while I was in Christianity. So, um, it was January 2017 was the first time I heard God speak to me. I was in my room doing laundry and God began to speak to me and kind of just begin to prophesy to me directly. I don't remember word for word what was said because the lasting impression that I was focusing on is that God is real. God talks back. That was really the only thing in my head during that moment. So I spent. So that was January of 2017. I'm in high school during this time. So the summer comes. So I spend three months, the whole summer, with no sleep, asking God questions all day. I leave in the morning, I leave my room in the morning, go do my chores, um, interact with my family when, when it was regular. But I would always go back into my room and during the nighttime, everyone else is asleep, I'd stay awake and I'd sit in the presence of God and I'd just have Q and A's with God, asking God questions, getting answers, getting downloads. And I've never had more energy than the three months that I spent, um, without sleep where I received a grace for the relationship in that moment 
where as I was pursuing God, I was energized. And that that was for the full summer of 2017. So three months straight, no sleep. All I did was pray and talk to God. And when I say talk to God, I mean it literally where I would sit and listen. It was in that time period where I got to know the difference between the uh, the Father, Holy Spirit, and the Son. I got to learn the difference between them due to the amount of time we were spending together. I began to see in the Spirit. I started seeing demons and seeing angels and things like that. Um, as brilliant as I still believe my former church was, they didn't really emphasize the supernatural like that. So there was no teaching or training or even really the language for it before I started having my encounters. So I was, in a sense, self-taught when it came to the supernatural. Everything that I've taught came from my personal experiences. And a lot of it started in 2017, the summer I spent with God, just sitting there listening and asking and like sometimes I would ask a question and it would it, before I, I sometimes I would ask a question and I would sit there quietly for hours and then the answer would come, whether that be verbal or I just got a direct download. Sometimes before I could get the question out of my mouth, the answer is already being heard in the spirit. So it varied from time to time. Sometimes I went into my prayer closet and it was completely silent. Other times I played gospel music in the background. Sometimes I had audio books playing. Sometimes, like I said, nothing was playing. So it was in that space, just me in my prayer closet, praying and listening and waiting and getting attuned with the presence of God, accessing the power of God. So I went about a year just hyped up on the power of God because then it became a uh, somewhat of a habit for me where there went a time where I set an alarm on my phone for each hour so that I could pray at least 24 times a day. Um, sometimes I would pray f so long that I went into the next hour. Other times I'd pray for a few seconds or a few minutes and then go back to bed because it was every hour on the hour. So 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I was praying some sort every hour. So then there came a time when like I went back to school. So obviously I can't do that all day. So my prayer time became uh, 10 p.m. Because I figured come 10 p.m. I've pretty much finished everything that I would need to do. And I shouldn't be interrupted at 10 p.m. So. I would start my prayer at 10 p.m. Whatever I was doing, I would stop, go pray. And I would uh, I would go in my prayer closet. And at a certain point, I ran out of questions to ask God and was really just interested in what would happen. I, I was like, will God share something with me? Will I just get overwhelmed by power at this time? Because this is also my stage of self-deliverance, where, uh, yeah, this was also my stage of self-deliverance, where I was spending so much time in the presence of God that I would begin to purge. I would cough up, I, I, I was going through deliverance, coughing up demons, uh, having whatever was going on in my epigenetics cleansed out of me because I was spending that much time with God. So by the time I started encountering other people who walked in the supernatural and they would pray for me or try to minister to me and nothing would happen, it would be strange, but they didn't know that I had gone through at least a year of purging and deliverance beforehand. But I would pray at 10 o'clock every day and I wouldn't leave until I got something. Sometimes I would go to pray and I'd sit in my prayer closet for hours before I felt the first goosebump, before I got the first chill. Other times I would go into my prayer closet and the moment I went in there, the presence would rush over me and I'd pass out. 
it just varied from time to time. But I was faithful and I was consistent with meeting with God. So the issue of knowing whether I'm talking to God or something else isn't something that I started off with an issue with. Because, unlike a lot of people, I spent three months with just the voice, getting to know the voice of God. Whenever I've missed a prophetic word or something like that in my earlier years, it wasn't due to me mishearing God. It had to do with me trying to do things that I had seen other ministers do. Following other people's archetypes, I've never had an issue with hearing God. Um, God might not tell me all the information I might want, but I've never struggled to hear or figure out what God was telling me. That That's never been the issue. For example, and because when God told me I was a prophet, I didn't know what that was. I grew up Baptist. There was pastors, there were deacons, and occasionally evangelists. The idea of a prophet was so bizarre. I was like, I talked to my pastor at the time. I was like, God told me I was a prophet. What do they do? <laughs> and he gave me his idea of it, but I started studying. I went on YouTube and I was looking for pe other people who possibly were prophets, some of them being con artists. I know that now. But at the time, I was just starting off. I didn't have an archetype for what prophets were. So I'm watching people like Matthew Stevenson, Brian Karn. I'm, wa I'm watching all the prophet people I could find. I'm, a, I'm seeing uh, Shepard Bashiri and Hubert Angel. I'm seeing all these guys. So there came a point, it's like it's imprinting on me. I'm trying some of the things that they're doing, and it's not working for me. So it messed up my credibility a bit starting out, but it wasn't me not being able to hear God. It was me attempting things that I saw other people do. So that became my lifestyle, praying at 10 at least, praying at 10 every day. And then I, uh, somewhere between... 2017 and 2019. So let's say 2018. Um, I begin to have that. That's when my heavenly encounters begin. So that's when I started. Like I said, I started seeing in the spirit just because of how much time I was spending in the presence. But. um. Yeah, so I started seeing in the spirit just because of how much time I was spending in the presence. And I'd seen glimpses of the father at that time. I'd seen the father's feet seated while he was sitting on a throne. So I knew that something was wrong. It's like, okay, no one could see the father and live and no one could see God and live. I'm like, well, I saw the father. I broke a rule. Um, <laughs> I remember seeing Holy Spirit came into my room one day. I'd seen glimpses of her silhouette before, but I just wasn't sure. I thought it was somebody in a clerical robe. So I wasn't thinking that's a woman in a dress at the time. Um, actually, what really launched me into expecting or the, at least the desire for supernatural visions and encounters like that came from my former pastor. Um, where he had an experience where he went to sleep one night. And God woke him up. And when he opened his eyes, he was in outer space. And he was looking at the cosmos. He was seeing planets and stars and all types of astral bodies. So I heard his encounter as he told it. And I said, wow, God, I want to see that. <laughs> and I had my own encounters in outer space. Yes, I know the earth is, is spherical. It's not, it's not flat because I've been in outer space. Um. <laughs> But that, that's what kind of launched me into expecting visual responses. Before then, I was getting glimpses. I was getting, uh, I was seeing angels. I was seeing demons. So I, I was seeing, I just wasn't having those type of encounters yet. So it was somewhere around 2018 where I started having my own, where uh, I remember I had just got out of prayer. Like I said, I 10 o'clock every day I'd go pray. I got out of my prayer closet. I'm not sleepy. <laughs> I'm not sleepy because I just got done praying. I'm energized. I'm walking towards my bed and a portal opened up next to my bed. 
and it only lasted for a few seconds, three seconds, four seconds, the longest. It was really short. But in that short window, I could see clouds made a light and I could see the silhouette of what looked like a kingdom to me. And I heard the voice of God say, soon. And I had heard stories growing up, but never took them too serious of people who'd had heavenly encounters um, or went to heaven or went to hell and came back to tell their story. Like, I've heard of that, but I didn't really take it too serious. But in that moment, I knew that God wasn't threatening to kill me. I knew I was going to be someone that uh, had those types of encounters also, or at least experienced it one time. Um, so eventually around that time, I, like I said, I'm still studying prophets. I'm a novice. I still don't really know what prophets are yet. So I'm still studying. I came across Bruce Allen, Dr. Bruce Allen, who's one of my favorite people. I still honor him today. And one of his popular teachings is translation by faith. So I heard him talk about some of his experiences of being translated and teleported all over the world to do, uh, amazing things in ministry. So I tried it and pretty much his whole thing is just do it by faith. So I remember I closed my eyes and I took a step into heaven by faith and I slammed onto the floor under the power of God. And I was like, okay, this is real. <laughs> so that was my intro into engaging the spirit by faith, going where you want it to go, being where you needed to be just by doing it and allowing your spirit to do the rest of the work. So I started having more and more encounters. Um, it had already happened before then. I left that out in 2017. was also the same time I met Samson, the guy from the Bible, the strong guy. He's been my mentor for years. Um, and he's the one who taught me how to pray. I had a short vision where I asked the father, I was like, so I know that we're in a new covenant. I'm like, so Samson had all this power in his covenant in his day. How would we access that same type of power in this day, in this covenant? And he said, ask him yourself. And it was in that moment, Samson taught me how to pray, which was just in that form. It was just sitting and receiving directly from God, immersing yourself in the spirit with the idea of kind of like a sponge. You can only use as much as you've been filled with it was pretty much what I was learning. So that set the paradigm for how I prayed. It was a moment to receive more than not. That's mostly the paradigm was I meet with God and I receive the presence of God and the power of God. And then I can use that same those same attributes later if I need to. So I'd already had encounters with the cloud of witnesses. I was seeing angels and demons. I'd seen Holy Spirit. I'd seen the Father. I've even started having some level of experiences with experiencing heaven. Or at least stepping into that climate, that atmosphere. Um, in some cases, it was visual. But I started going to heaven myself, and it was after I already started having my encounters where I ran into people like Nancy Cohen and Ian Clayton and Justin Abraham and Mike Parsons, people who talked about experiencing heaven on a regular basis, living from there, and the heaven they described next to the heaven that I had seen. And with all of that, I was still somewhat unsatisfied because I hadn't met Yeshua yet. So this is leading up to 2019, where for about six months, I acted like a brat begging God for a face to face encounter with Yeshua. And I remember some of my students, some of the people that I was mentoring at the time, they started having face to face encounters, heard about David E. Taylor, and he was having face to face encounters and all these random people. I heard a bunch of stories. I remember one random kid at school heard me talking about it. He was like, really? I thought everyone seen him at least once. He's like, I saw him in dreams a few times. I'm like, I didn't have a dream. I didn't have a vision. I didn't see a homeless person where I could just convince myself. Okay. I saw, I, I, I saw Jesus. Cause that's what I called him at the time. So I was like, I need to have an experience. I'm like, Samson 
I I met Samson. Holy Spirit appeared. That's a woman because I saw her. I've seen the father's feet. I've seen all these different angels, all these different beings. But you, the guy that's supposed to love me so much you died for me, won't show up. I was irritated. So then I begged for like six months. Nothing happened. Me and my mom were on a cruise ship because we don't celebrate Christmas. So we were on a cruise ship for New Year's. And uh, she was away and I was in the cabin by myself reading a book. I was reading Justin Abraham's book, Beyond Human. And I was on the chapter on metamorphosis and I felt the presence of God enter the room. Mind you, I'm well acquainted with the presence, so it wasn't foreign to me. So I look and Yeshua steps through the wall. And in that moment, I understood what it meant to be undone as the Bible had described it because I felt him separate my body, soul, and spirit. I felt them move and react to different, in different ways just with him being that close. Um, and it was after that, I, like, I've had a face-to-face -face relationship with Yeshua ever since. Um, and the rest of the royal family, it was then that I was comfortable enough to embrace the cloud of witnesses and angels again. Because I refused to see any of that without having an encounter with who I called Jesus at the time. But it was after that I stepped into an even greater depth of the supernatural. That's when I started translating and I started multi-locating and people would see me in different places all the time. And we'd travel and people would come up to me and say, hey, you prayed for me. And I'd never been there before, traveling in other countries, ministering across the world. And I physically never left Texas. That all started after that encounter with Yeshua. Um, so that's just like a brief background. That, that's my start. Is that, that that's kind of my start. So I ended up leaving Christianity through the relationship with God. Where I started to step away from religion for one, because I started to understand that most of the structures in religion had nothing to do with God. Uh, the ideologies, the structure, it was completely unrelated to God. And it started to bother me because of the relationship that I had. But I didn't leave my church until I got permission to leave my church from God. There came a moment around 2020 or early or, or more so late 2019 when God told me I'm free to leave. I talked to my pastor. Uh, well, it was Right shortly after that, the pandemic happened and churches shut down. So I wasn't able to talk to my pastor for some time. But once I was, I came and talked to him. He had no problem with it because he backed away from trying to lead me forever ago. He was a very honest and genuine person. He believed I was hearing God. I'd prophesied to him accurately before, just telling him some of the things that I was experiencing because that's what you do in that system. You have an issue. You have some confusion. You don't go to God. You go to the pastor. Well, my pastor was a good leader. He said, well, if you're hearing God, keep hearing God. I, I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> so he encouraged me to trust the relationship I was building with God. Um, and again, I stress me and him are still good to this day. <laughs> um, so I... Because of my upbringing and because of my connection, I was uncomfortable with not calling myself a Christian. In hindsight, I realized I hadn't been a Christian for a very long time. But verbally, I still introduced myself as a Christian. You find some of my older Facebook posts. I was still talking about what real Christian should be like or addressing the, the church or Christianity because I still associated myself mentally with that group where I still saw myself as one of them, a different area of them, but still them. I considered myself a Christian mystic. So eventually I remember I was at work and I do this thing where I'll just listen into the spirit to see what's going on. Or I'll begin to have conversations and not even conversation, but just listen to teachings that happen in the spirit world. 
So I, this particular day, I was listening to the seven spirits of God. Just talk because they there are teachers. So I was at work. I had some time and I was listening to them as you would a radio. And they were somewhat mentoring me talking about Christhood. And they were like. The word. Christ means anointed one. So anyone with the anointing is a Christ. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. You know, I'm at work, so I'm not really responding too much because I'm at work. And they start talking about some of the verses in the Bible where they're like, Yeshua, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? It's like you notice they knew Paul as his own individual. I'm like, you're right. You're right. Pretty much this whole session, they spent that work session talking to me about the anointing and our relationship, our responsibility in it. Eventually, Holy Spirit chimed in. And she emphasized, she's like, Yeshua, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? If you're anointed, you're a Christ. I'm like, okay, I think I know what y'all are talking about. Okay. So then we end the conversation that day. Um, I tell a better version of this in another video. <laughs> Happened years ago. So the next day I met my current wife at that time, my fiance, I was at, I went to her house and it was before I even put the key in the door. Yeshua jumped in on the conversation a day later and he, me and him kind of just were talking in the parking lot, like in the driveway before I went in and he said, Christianity is antichrist. And I'm like, whoa, what do you mean by that? You know, I still think I'm a Christian, so I'm bothered. I'm like, why would you say that? How is that? And he said, Christ means anointed one. Christian, by default, is a follower of the anointed one. And then he reminded me of his story where he said, eat my body drink my blood, and all his followers left. He says, I've never cared about followers. What I was trying to replicate were Christ's more anointed ones in the earth. He said, the issue, Christianity is anti-Christ because it keeps you in a state of forever following the anointed one rather than growing as the anointed one yourself. And I'm like, whoa, I understand that. He's like, every person I trained is a Christ. Every anointed person is a Christ. They're a Messiah. And in my head, I'm thinking about that verse that's like, okay, there'll be false Christ and false messiahs. I'm like, well, this isn't what he's talking about. He's talking like, and, and as I just looked at the definitions, I'm like, he's right. Anyone with the oil on them, anyone carrying God's anointing is a Messiah. So false messiahs and false Christs are people who pretend to carry it that don't. <laughs> so it's like David was a Messiah. Uh, all of his disciples were Messiahs. Everyone who was anointed was. Uh, even the idea of Yeshua the Christ or Yeshua Hamashiach, that's just a title, the Christ, the anointed one. And that's when I started to really walk in the identity of, I am the anointed one. I'm on the same journey that Yeshua was teaching people to go on. Self-realization, stepping back into your God-given identity, that, that's where I'm at. So it was at that point I stopped calling myself Christian because he called it antichrist. It's counterproductive to leave yourself in a state of following. He's like, think about it. I never cared about the followers that came or left. Never cared. I'm like, you're right about that. <laughs> so that was my official divorce of Christianity. Where I broke away from the label and I'm like, I no longer belong to a religion. I came to understand that 
uh, I hadn't given a fair uh, a fair observation to many other cultures and creeds, and that's when I started looking into them. But not just from a uh, scholarly standpoint, I've I never stopped being a mystic. So I just had new conversations with God on different things, talking about. Do you know these people? Okay, what do these people carry? What about this? What about that? I reopened some topics that I closed because I was still holding on to Christianity being the best and being the only way. It's like, well, sonship is the only way. God never commissioned a religion. Yeshua's message was never religious. It was governmental. (laughs) So that really changed my walk where I no longer affiliated with any religion. So since even though I embrace many different facets that other cultures embrace, I don't claim to be a part of any of them. But that doesn't make me necessarily an enemy to any of them either. Um, <laughs> because I never left God. My journey has been spirit led since it started. It was me hearing God and deciding to trust God fully. It was in 2020 that I had a restart where I realized that there were things that I was sharing and things that I was teaching that I hadn't gotten from direct conversation with God. So I started over and I've been relearning everything since then. Deciding and it used to irritate some Christians because they'd ask me a question that you can read about in the Bible. And I'd say, I don't know. They're like, well, just read it. I'm like, I don't know. Could be a mistranslation. I have no idea. Me and God haven't talked about it. I refuse to answer. Because above all else, I've always valued my credibility. So the idea of telling people God told me this and then you later come back and say, sorry, y'all, I studied and I was wrong. Well, that that affects your credibility. So I made sure out of out of my own integrity, I don't share things in public that I haven't gotten confirmation on, that I haven't had conversations with God about. The few times that I do, I make sure to specify this is just a theory. These are just some thoughts. This is an idea that I had. Because I want the things that are God taught to remain God taught and I don't want it to get blurry. Where if I'm saying it in public, God taught me this. Or someone in the cloud of witnesses taught me this. Where I trust heaven as a source. So that's pretty much what my ministry has been now, is teaching people how to encounter God the way that I have, how to have their own experiences, how to see God themselves, how to hear God themselves, and encouraging them to trust what they see and trust what they hear. Sharing the things that I've learned in my journey, uh, teaching people to walk in their kingdom identity. That's what I do. So a lot of people, when they began to deconstruct religion, they weren't spirit led. So the moment that Christianity fell apart, they ran into every other deception they could get a hold of. They left Christianity and became a Muslim. They left Christianity and became a Buddhist. They left Christianity and became an atheist. They left. That wasn't the path I I, I did. I left all the religions, but I kept God. Now, God's government is so big that I relate to many different groups now. I don't claim to be a part of any of them. Yes, I teach on comedic spiritual science, but I don't claim to be comedic only. Yes, I understand the Hebraic better than some of your rabbis, but I don't claim to be Hebraic only at all. I didn't leave Christianity become Hebraic or to become Kemetic. Um, I may claim bits and pieces of them where it's like, hey, I embrace the Taoists. I embrace the the Kemites. I embrace the Hebraic, but I'm factionless. There's no one group that can claim me other than the kingdom of God. (laughs) So, That's been a brief overview of my journey out of religion. So where am I now is just someone who's continuing to be spirit led, led by their kingdom identity. Learning to be a solution to the issues of creation, bringing things back into harmony and balance, enlightening the minds of those in the world. Calling people to their kingdom identity, 
showing them what I've seen. So that's it for this session. Um, again, there's a few days left to sign up if you're interested in my mentorship course. Um, enrollment for that closes on March 1st. This may come again in the future. Um, if you haven't already, subscribe. Leave some comments down below for things that you'd like for me to cover. Um, but if you're interested in that mentorship course, that's schoolofthempire.com. The link is in the description down below. Um, I also have a Patreon, which accesses a lot of my teachings. I share a lot of what I've been hearing in the spirit um, <laughs> throughout my journey. A lot of the sciences that I've come to understand. There's also uh, my book, Fullness, Guide to Sonship and Mysticism, that's available on uh, Barnes & Noble, Kindle, and Amazon. So if you're a reader and you're interested in some new mystical literature to get a hold of, um, that's available. That was my compilation of all of the things that I learned from 2017 till the time that I published it. And I do plan on making volumes because I'm still learning. I'm still embracing different things. It was after I finished my book that I started studying Kemet. So uh, a lot of my Kemetic revelations aren't in that book, but there will be another. So, um, yeah, <laughs> all of my information is in the description down below. Y'all be blessed.